there is this tutorial zero there here um, if you want to really dive into NumPy and the ND array, the um, N dimensional array data type. Um, but I won't cover that here. So we can um, skip this. And if you want to go ahead in the repository you downloaded, open up gridded data tutorial one. Um, and so this notebook is an introduction to X-Array. If you would like to follow along, if you're actually running these, um, uh, what I am going to do here is actually go to kernel and then restart kernel and clear all, all outputs because I've already ran these notebooks all the plots and outputs are there so if you want to run it yourself this is like a nice way to just kind of reset the whole thing if you don't want to run it you can just scroll down or you can just watch my screen um, and advancing from one block of code or text to the next just a reminder that's hitting shift enter um, and what else? Um, I think I can just get started then. So um, you can see actually I have this little blue indicator says I have this like top block of text selected if I hit shift enter. If I have my cursor on there, um, it moves to the next block. So in this notebook, uh, we're gonna talk about X-Array. It's a Python library that lets us create some new um, object data types, data arrays, and data sets. And we'll learn how to manipulate these with some fake data we make here. In the next notebook, we'll get into some real data. Um, and so we'll explore these here. So um, when we're talking about gridded data, what does that mean? Bart's kind of covered all this um, information. Really, you can just picture it. It's a 2D array of, um, of data. You could expand that to then three dimensions. So you could have like latitude, longitude, and elevation and then at each of those three dimensional points have some sort of value like maybe surface temperature or precipitation or snow depth um, so yeah examples of gridded data are like satellite images so at each pixel in the image is like a grid or a grid cell um, and so that's like the reflected light off the surface or the emitted infrared radiation or a microwave whatever wavelength you're looking at um, climate model output um, you know, where the models evaluated at nodes or at grid cells. And then the common data types, we're going to be working with net CDF data um, in the next notebook, uh, but there are, there's information about some other common data types here. And uh, for the Python packages, like I said, we're going to use X-Array um, and, uh, and some CardoPy as well, um, but there's some other packages that work with other gridded data types you might be interested in. So uh, I really like this figure for X-Array because it helps visualize what we're talking about when we say gridded data in multiple dimensions. So X-Array lets us create multi-dimensional data arrays, um, but it also includes metadata and we can label our data sets. So it's kind of like a, uh, expanding on both NumPy and Pandas. And you'll actually see a lot of what Ifon just showed functionality, especially with Pandas. Um, kind of carry on over into X-Array. And so like in this image below, we could have um, some sort of reference system, X and Y and then T for time maybe. So each of those points in our grid has a longitude and latitude. And then we have these sort of data cubes of precipitation and temperature over time. So to get started, uh, we're going to import X-Array uh, here using a common alias for it, just a shorthand notation, XR. We're also going to import, import NumPy and Pandas and then matplotlib for plotting. And the first thing we can look at here with X-Array are the data array objects. So these are um, similar to the NumPy um, and D array uh, with the addition of having these labeled dimensions, coordinates, and you can add other metadata. So they're composed of values, which are actual data values stored as a NumPy array. Uh, dimensions will be the name for each dimension of that array. Coordinates would be the values of those dimensions. So your dimensions would be like latitude and longitude, and then the coordinates are the actual latitude and longitude values that then correspond with the data. And then attributes can just be um, other metadata you want to uh, store in your data set. So here, I'm going to create some fake air temperature data. Um, 
just because I want a small nugget of data to work with on these examples and show you how all these pieces um, fit together. So let's say we want to have 100 years of maximum air temperature on a 10 by 10 grid. And so here I'm using a NumPy function um, that creates a, a random numbers from a normal distribution to create, um, so I chose like a mean and standard deviation that I want um, those temperature values to follow. And then I want to generate samples that in the shape 100 for my years by 10 by 10. So my 10 and 10 will be like my latitude and longitude. So we just create, so this function here, air temperature max equals our uh, NumPy random normal function, will generate those uh, random numbers. And if we just type in air temperature max and press shift enter on this cell, it'll spit out all our values and actually not all of them because it shows dot, dot, dot. We've got a lot of values here. Oops. Um, and just to check, we can type air temperature underscore max dot shape. And this gives us the shape of the array we just created. So this is just a NumPy ND array that we've created. And that will be our values in an X array data array. The other components of that data array are going to be our dimensions and coordinates. So first, let's make the coordinates for our 100 years. We'll use this pandas function date range, uh, where we'll specify we want to start at 1920, go for 100 periods, and we'll set the frequency of that period to one year. So 1y is the code for setting that frequency. Then we want to make coordinates for our longitude and latitude values. Again, I, I just picked some random, this somewhere in North America. I don't know where that is. Um, and using a NumPy function to create linearly spaced numbers, um, 10 of them for both longitude and latitude. And then for our dimensions, we need names. So what are the things that uh, X-Array is going to call these, these um, three different dimensions, two in space, one in time? So we're going to call them time, latitude, and launch, or lat and long. And finally, we can create a little dictionary. So here we're just going to, for our metadata, we're just going to say like, okay, our units are in Celsius and a description, maximum annual air temperature. So here's where we finally create the data array. With this function, xr for x-array dot data array, we specify our, our values, so our air temperature max, which was our um, array of random numbers we generated. We give it our coordinates. So here we have years, lat, and long. And note that these aren't strings, these are variables. These are the variables we created up here for our year range, our long and lat ranges. Uh, we pass our dimensions, so this is this uh, list of strings, time, lat, and lawn. We can give our data array a name, and then also set the attributes to our metadata dictionary, which we just made previously. So now, if we just run a cell um, in Jupyter with just the name of uh, our data array variable, we'll get a nice little preview here. Um, which it first tells us this is an X-ray data array object. And it has the name T air max. And we can see uh, that it has a time dimension of 100, a latitude dimension size 10, and longitude size 10. It gives us a preview here of all the values. Um, we can click this little icon here to, to hide that actually. And it shows us this nice little table of our coordinates, a preview of their values, uh, and our attributes, our metadata down here. Um, so we can see our units and description. All these sort of things are also accessible if you were to type something like the name of the data array, so tier underscore max dot dims for dimensions, that will give us the names of our three dimensions. Similarly, we can retrieve our coordinates this way and our attributes to get the metadata out. And then we can also pull out our values again. So now, um, what if we want to plot this data, look at it, or do some manipulation with it? Um, data arrays, just like pandas um, data frames and NumPy 
uh, ND arrays can be indexed or sliced. Um, and so there are all these different methods for doing this. Um, there's a handy table here to reference. But um, for our first example, let's say we want to select just um, T air max for 2019. So we can use this dot cell method, just like in pandas, and specify we want time equals 2019. And let's say plot this. So what does that look like? And if you think about, OK, imagine what do we have? We have a 100 by 10 by 10 sort of cube, not a cube, stretched cube of data. And we're just taking one year out of that. So we should be getting from three dimensions just two dimensions which is an image. So here's a 10 by 10 array uh, plotted of our air temperature for just uh, 2019. And X-ray actually does some nice stuff, like it automatically adds axes labels and a color bar. So there, you can customize these things so much, but just the default's pretty nice. Um, we can also, instead of selecting a year, we can select um, a just one point, specify latitude and longitude uh, using the same dot cell method. Um, here I actually made it kind of easy because I picked whole numbers for latitude and longitude. So I don't have to do any sort of like interpolation, um, but we'll, we'll get into that in the next data set when you don't know exactly what latitude and longitude you want to um, select. But if we just, you do select latitude equals 34, longitude minus 114 dot plot, X-ray will generate a time series plot. So now we have time on the X-axis, our T air max on the Y-axis, and the title shows us where we are. So here's our random numbers that we've generated, but we can pretend that's air temperature. If we wanna select a shorter time range from this, we can actually select uh, using the same dot cell method, we can select both um, a latitude and longitude, so a single point in space, but also a uh, slice through time. I know there were comments about the different methods of doing this. There are, like, you could use the, I think it was like the pandas date range was another way to do this, but here I'm using the slice method where I'm saying I want to go from 2000 to 2020 um, and then plot the result of this. So this is actually going to be the same as the plot above, except zoomed in on 2000 to 2020. So it's just the, the last um, 20 years, of the fake data we created. If we just try to plot the whole, all, everything all at once, if we just say T air max plot, uh, X-ray is smart enough. It actually, it just gives us a histogram, which is kind of neat. I mean, this is a histogram of uh, 100 years of fake air temperature data, but hey, it plotted something, so that's kind of cool. Um, there, are, if, you, if you then want a histogram of just, um, you know, maybe a time slice, you could add in a cell on time slice from, let's say, 2000 to 2020 and plot. That's not going to work. Oh. I'm missing a parentheses. Hey, now we have a histogram that's maybe different because we've selected a different uh, time range instead of doing all the data. So those are data arrays. Now we can combine data arrays into a data set where we have multiple data arrays. So our data array was air temperature. Uh, what if we want to also include um, uh, minimum air temperature and precipitation in the same for all the same grid points and all the same points through time. We can make two more data arrays with again I'm I'm making up random random data here for air temperature minimum, cumulative precipitation, and then creating data arrays the same way I did previously. Um, note that I didn't need to recreate my years, latitude, longitude, or dimensions because I'm using the same, uh, the same um, coordinates and dimensions for these data, data arrays. And because I use the same coordinates and dimensions for these data arrays, all three of these data arrays, T or max, T or min, 
precip, I can just use this command xarray.merge. And because all those match, it will merge them all together into a single data set. So if we, if we preview this data set, we see it still has the same shape, latitude 10, longitude 10, time 100. But now we have more than one data variable. We don't just have tier max, we have these other two. And we can actually open up each one and look at some of the attributes. So tier min also shows units and description. Um, I've added units and description to cumulated precipitation as well. So just like with the data array, we can index on the data set um, with the iCell and cell method. I didn't go into the positional indexing, but that uh, only applies to the data array. So now when we select here, uh, this is a data set, we select a longitude and latitude, we get a time series of 100 points in time, uh, the single point, and we have all three variables there. Um, in time. Um, this is similar where we're using I cell. So I being, we're using an index to select, we could just say select the, the first time step, which is Python starts counting at zero. Um, and so now instead of having a time series, we have uh, selected the first point in time and have a 10 by 10 array of all three of our variables in the data set. So uh, I won't step through all of this because I've added a lot of like plotting um, formatting things here, but this is an example of combining everything uh, in the notebook up until now to make some plots. So I'm creating a, a plot with two, sub, two rows of plots. I'm picking a point. I'm plotting um, T air max using the cell method, um, plotting, uh, tier min using the same method, adding a title, and then plotting precipitation. So these are going to be time series at a single point. And I'm um, actually this also saves the, the uh, plot out to a JPEG file. So we can create a nice plot here. So here's the time series, but we can also plot um, uh, maps of some of these values uh, here. So I'm going to select two different years, let's say 1980 and then 2019 and using the cell method for, um, for each of those on maximum air temperature, minimum air temperature, and precipitation. So we're going to end up with six plots in total, because I'm going to make three for each of two years. So we've got some maps of random data here. Um, and then functions for exporting are pretty easy with X-Array. Uh, we can specify the name of our data set and say to netcdf. This saves this as a netcdf file. We can also convert from xarray into pandas and say our data set name, my data, to data frame, which gives us this um, spreadsheet looking um, pandas data frame of all of our values. And we can take this data frame and save it as a CSV file if we wanted to do that. Um, I think that's all I have for the first notebook. So I'm happy to take questions now before we take a brief break and then I zip through the next notebook. Well, I mean, right now we actually do not have any questions in Slack. Um, <laughs> so, which I take to be a good sign, uh, Stephen. Is it a good sign? I think it is, <laughs> but Phil is, uh, Philip is right now uh, typing a question, I think. So we'll hold off. If anybody has questions about this first part, uh, please uh, put them in. Okay, so here's a question. How could we convert from, from, a, from a cube, like, like a stretch, you know, uh, uh, break like you have right now, back to shapefiles? So how did, would you go back from like a grid of data that you have to something that provides an outline? Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I'd say, uh, <laughs> wait for Emilio's tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree. But nice Emilio, cop out. maybe you can. Nice cop out. I will, I will um, show the, the, the reverse going from um, shapefiles to gridded, the gridding process. There are tools for doing what you're saying, though. And just to stick to the spatial area, for example, uh, contours are a kind of um, um, 
vectorization. <laughs> You take continuous data and you create lines out of that. If you have something that, for example, watersheds, if you have a gridded watershed that uh, um, you have three polygons, but are actual cells, there are tools and none of, nothing comes to mind right now, but I am positive there are tools that will take the grid, identify common values, and then give you back a polygon um, representation. Yeah. Um, I think there's one more question coming because I see somebody typing, but um, I'll, maybe we'll uh, I'll flag that one and we can ask it at that. No, no. And you said there's a know. break, uh, Stephen, but I don't think there's a break right now. No, no, no. This is the break for questions. So okay. now, we'll, yeah, yeah. So, well, <laughs> actually, uh, there's several, several people are typing. Uh, please ask your questions. We'll come back to them and we'll answer them as we can. Uh, but we'll continue with the presentation for now. We'll come back for later questions. So sounds we'll, good. We'll, okay, take it away. Yeah, um, I want to get out of fake data land and talk about real data. Um, so um, I'm now in the gridded data tutorial two notebook where we're going to talk about accessing DAMUT data and manipulating it using X-ray, what we've just covered. Um, I'm looking up my notes here, make sure I don't miss part of the introduction. Okay. Um, so yeah, by the end of this notebook, you'll be able to access DayMet and do some manipulations with it, make some plots. Um, so uh, what is DayMet? It's a gridded data source um, provided by the Oak Ridge National Lab that's uh, based on observations, um, but has uh, model algorithms that interpolate this to create a a spatially contiguous data set of meteorological variables across North America, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Um, and so this data set includes things like air temperature, vapor pressure, uh, snow water equivalent. Um, I'll, I'll, I have a list of them later, we'll see. Um, so how, how do we access this? Well, you could just go to the um, the web portal they have and they, they have like ways for you can download single days of, of uh, data. So this is, you know, you would just download one net CDF file that's one day at one kilometer resolution. That's not very useful. Um, Olmo does have some uh, tools to get time series for a single point. Uh, there's also a package called DaymetPy, uh, which I've never used before, but I guess these interface with um, some of the uh, web services that they provide for DayMet. We will, however, be using the OpenDAP uh, API that Bart mentioned as a, uh, earlier this morning as a way to access data. Um, if you were to go to the, uh, well, I can just click on it, the catalog page for this project product for the, um, this is the daily surface weather data on a one kilometer grid for North America version three. Um, the specific DayMet project we're using, product we're using here. Um, on their website, it has all the documentation and how to cite it, metadata. But um, what we're interested in here is the OpenDAP uh, data access URL. Um, and from that URL, this URL here, um, X-Array actually knows how to read this. And so we can just provide this URL to X-Array and it will, without having to go and download the data ourselves from the website or anything, X-Array will pull the data down into memory and they can start to work with it. So, um, oh, I'm going to clear all the cell out ones here. Um, so we're going to, again, import X-Array, but I'm also gonna import GeoPandas uh, CRS from the PyProj library to deal with some map projections and then uh, geometry from the Shapely library to deal with some vector geometry to define points and areas we want to look at uh, in the matplotlib for plotting. So with X-Array, we can just say um, xr.opendataset and give it this URL. So this ncml uh, file is like a net CDF markup language, I guess. This is the OpenDAP endpoint. Um, that X-Ray knows how to read. Um, so if we just run this, we can see what did we open? If we just type in 
I called it DS or data set. We can see that we have a huge data set here. So 14,600 time steps. So that's 14,600 days, because this is a daily product, by 7,800 something and 8,000 something uh, grid cells. And those are kilometer grid cells. So this is a huge area. It's North America. Um, and this shows all of our coordinates, x, y, time. We also have latitude and longitude um, in here. And then our data variables, uh, let's see. So we have day length, uh, precipitation, uh, solar radiation, snow water equivalent, temperature max, min, and vapor pressure. And again, clicking on these can show us that we have all the metadata embedded in here. So it shows the name, the units, um, also shows our um, grid mappings or a map projection that's being used. And that information is actually, they store it here as a data variable. And this shows us all the information we need to know how to project this map um, in uh, geospatial coordinates. And then it's got more metadata here about processing and go to their website. Um, here's our nice figure, um, which sort of resembles the uh, Daymet data set. So if we want to look at a single variable and its metadata, we just did this. We can type ds.precip um, and, and we're looking at just that one variable within Daymet. Um, so the coordinate reference system, we can look at the attributes of that. This gives us all the information we need for uh, mapping this data. Um, but this is a huge data set and I don't want to load all of it in memory. Like I see up here on the top right, I have like four gigs of memory on this Jupyter Hub instance and I'm definitely not going to load this whole thing in there. So we're going to use indexing and slicing to grab a smaller area to look at. So I'm going to say, let's, let's just look at around Washington state because that's where I live. Um, and a reminder, here are all the different ways you can slice and index um, X-ray data sets. But what we're going to do is define a bounding box using the uh, Shapely library and uh, GeoPandas to create a geometry file. So this is actually a vector um, data type. And then we're going to uh, transform from latitude and longitude coordinates of that shape file into the projection, uh, coordinate projection system that's used by Daymet, and then use that to select an area to look at. So first, we're defining our bounding box here. So this is a geometry uh, from the Shapely library. We give it um, a minimum longitude, uh, minimum latitude, max lawn and lat, and then specify our coordinate reference system and turn this into a GeoPandas geo series. So this creates our bounding box. We then are going to use the PyProj library to take our um, data sets. Uh, projection information. So this is the Daymet. Uh, it uses this Lambert conformal conic uh, map projection. And Py, the PyProj library lets us um, read that. And so we're going to store it in a variable called Daymet CRS. And then we can take our bounding box and we can change its uh, coordinate reference system to our Daymet coordinate reference system. So up above, when we created our bounding box, we gave it this EPSG uh, 4326, that's the WSG84 coordinate reference system. Um, and now we're going to transform it into our Daymet Lambert conformal conic uh, coordinate reference system. If we look at our bounding box object, we can see that it has a data type of geometry. That's the uh, uh, GeoPandas data type. And it's a polygon uh, with these values. So these are no longer latitude and longitude. They're uh, meters, I believe, in the Lambert um, projection system. And what we really want is uh, the bounds of that box. So we're really just pulling back out the original longitude and latitude that we put in here. If we type in bounds, we can get, again, our minimum x, minimum y, max x and y. But these are now in our uh, Daymet projection. Um, and so finally, 
we can now use these bounds in the correct coordinate system uh, to select using the dot cell method in our x coordinate and our y coordinate on day, for day met. A, we're using a slice. So we start with the bounding box bounds minimum x, go to the maximum x, and then y. We actually go from maximum y to minimum y because in the Lambert projection system, the y axis is inverted. I didn't know that at first when I was putting this together and was confused. So what did we just select from day met? I called it Washington because I think I'm selecting a box around Washington. We still see our time uh, dimension is very long, uh, but our X and Y are now only several hundred uh, rather than thousands of kilometers. And we still have all of our data variables in here. So what does this look like? Let's plot it. So let's say we have our Washington data set, which is all of this. We want to select from that data set the Tmax data array, which is right here. It's uh, in our data variables. We're going to use I cell to select using an index uh, time equals zero. So that's just going to select the first time step, so the first day in our data set. And we're going to say plot, but we want to tell it to x array to plot um, using longitude and latitude for x and y. Otherwise, it would just be using the um, sort of arbitrary um, x and y coordinate system, just the shape of the array. And our result is a map of temperature around uh, sort of Washington state going into Canada and Oregon, it looks like. So this is really cool. We have a data set that's not too big that we can work with. Um, we can also, rather than selecting just in space, we can select in time and space. So um, let's say we want to look at snow water equivalent. Uh, for just a single water year. So October 2016, September 2017, um, somewhere near Mount Rainier. So I picked this point, it's near one of the visitor centers at Mount Rainier National Park. So instead of specifying a box to select um, from our day met data source, I'm instead going to specify just a point here. And similarly, defining the point as a GeoPandas Geo series and then converting it from its own coordinate reference system to DayMet's coordinate reference system. And now, uh, so I called this my point. And uh, if we were to look at my point, if you want to insert a new blank cell beneath another cell, um, you can just hit B on the keyboard for below or A for above. Uh, so I can insert the cell above. That's what I just did here. So if I just run my point, um, we can see that, again, we have a geometry, a point in the um, meters coordinates of our day met data source. So here we're going to stack together multiple select statements on our Washington data. So we start off with our Washington data set. We select the SWE data array that's within that. So that's the snow water equivalent. Our first select statement will be a time slice. So just from October 2016 to September 2017. And the second select statement, we're going to select uh, an X from my point, the X coordinate, and then Y from my point, the Y coordinate. The reason why we have to separate out these two different select methods instead of doing them together is because my, uh, my point here, the X and Y coordinates, don't match exactly for the X and Y coordinates of a grid cell in the day met data. So we have to tell it to use a method to find, and I'm going to say, find the nearest point. Uh, I cannot include time, a time slice, if I'm also saying method nearest because um, it, would, it would also try to find like a nearest time in this time slice, which doesn't make sense, and it would give me an error. So you have to separate those two out. And now we can look at the result of this. So we've selected in space and in time a single point for a single water year. We should have a time series that is one year long. 
And indeed, we see time. We have 364 as the length. Um, and uh, and the array of our data set or our data arrays here, the SWE values, and it still has all of our attributes in here, units. So now we can plot this. So my point SWE dot plot. We have a time series, snow water equivalent. At one point, we selected for one water year. Now say so. This is daily. Let's say we don't want daily data. Let's just say we want a monthly mean. We can use X arrays resampling methods to say, okay, take my point SWE uh, dot resample in the time uh, dimension and this code 1M, it knows to read that as one month. And then for that one month, take the mean of all the values there and then plot that. So now this is the same data, but it's been resampled to monthly. Similarly, we can, um, Oh, I get, I get into that in the next notebook, um, but I will show this quickly. Uh, if Here I'm just plotting a map showing where my point is in relation to um, a map of SWE of Mount Rainier, and I put a star here. Um, you can look at this plotting, these plotting functions later. It's um, x-ray and matplotlib. And then someone had asked about disaggregation, so I added this to the notebook. It will not, it's not on your notebook right now. Um, but let's say uh, we select precipitation. Um, so we start off with our Washington data set. We want to select, uh, we choose the precipitation data array. We select a time slice. So I'm just selecting a few weeks in February 2017. And then again, I'm going to select my point X and Y using the, the nearest method. So this gives us, a, again, a time series for a few weeks in February at our point. And if I plot this, well, it's a daily time series. So this is what it looks like, precipitation over those few days. Um, let's say we want to interpolate. And let's say for some reason, I really want to use a cubic interpolation method. This is just the example I have here. We can resample it to a higher frequency than the data set we actually have. So we're starting off with daily data, but I'm telling it to resample to one hour. But in order to do that, I also have to specify we want to interpolate and then give it a method to interpolate. So I'm just saying cubic, just because then it makes smooth lines. I know that's not realistic, but uh, and then we can plot this. So now we have hourly precipitation, assuming that a cubic interpolation actually works with this data set. Um, I guess very quickly, the last uh, notebook kind of just runs through Daymet some more, um, make some more plots. And, you know, I kind of came up with this question, like, let's say we want to look at snow water equivalent at Ma Mount Rainier. And um, how has April 1st snow water equivalent around Mount Rainier changed over the past 40 years? So Daymet provides us a record of 40 years. Um, whether or not we, we, we know how accurate Daymet is for this particular region, um, I actually don't know, but um, hey, my kernel crashed or something, so that's a good stopping point, I guess. 